So today I want to talk a little bit about grading and I want to talk about how we can grade in a way that helps students learn. We've done a ton of professional development in the past around equitable grading practices and the philosophy that really supports that. Um, today, all of the things that we're going to talk about definitely align to that, um, to the idea of equitable grading, but we want to shift and kind of, we'll, we will talk about philosophy a little bit, but I really want to focus more on some different strategies today. And so, as always, when we talk about grading, grading um, is a type of data, right, that we analyze. And so when we think about the type of grading practices that we want to implement in the classroom, especially through the lens of personalized learning, we want our grading practices to help promote a growth mindset for our students. We want that our grading practices to help us um, be able to differentiate and personalize learning in the classroom. And we definitely want to try to ensure that what we do in the classroom around grading um, is equitable for all students. So as we go through here, if any of you have any kind of questions about grading, philosophy, practices, things like that, feel free to reach out to myself or Melinda um, and we would be happy to talk through anything, brainstorm, all of those kind of things. So as always, when I'm talking about grading, that is not always an easy subject to dive into. And so when we have discussions around grading, I always ask that people have an open mind and open heart just to listen. Um, and then also to be respectful of the fact that not everyone comes to the table with the same set of experiences. And keeping that open mind and open heart and listening to each other with, in a respectful way and just being open to further learning, right? I'm one person talking to you today absolutely referring to the work of other individuals, but this is a journey that you have to decide to go on and you have to decide what's going to work really well for your students and in your class. And then to do that, I mean, we have to dig in and continue that learning process. So let's talk about why. Why are we talking about grading? <clears throat> and there's a lot of reasons why we should stop and really think about our grading practices. First and foremost, I want you to stop and I want you to think about your professional development that you had in the past, about your teacher preparation programs, whether you went the traditional route and got a teaching degree or your lateral entry, either way. How many of those programs really did a good job of looking at grading as a whole? the history of it, why we do certain things, and best practices around grading. And I'm not just talking through the lens of assessment and how to build an assessment, but really grading practices and how we should grade students. Oftentimes when I ask teachers this question, it is very rare that I get more than 25% of the teachers in the room that have had any kind of in-depth training around grading. And when you think about that, it's a little scary because there are so many decisions that we make about students based on grades, whether it's placement for certain classes, um, whether they get services, um, scholarships, um, different awards on awards days or awards ceremonies, even things like a driver's license. The law states that students have to be making adequate um, academic progress. Um, and so grades can play a role in eligibility for sports and other extracurriculars. So, I mean, there's so many decisions that get made where grades are a factor. And yet, a lot of us have not had in-depth training around grades and grading practices. So I love this quote, Joe Feldman, if you've been in any of my professional developments around grading, I love his work, but I love this quote in particular. No classroom can be truly equitable until we address this inequitable foundation of our schools and is talking about grading. And I love that, especially through the lens of what we just talked about, all the decisions that get made about students. And so if we have a system that is not equitable, and yet we have all these decisions that um, where grades play a factor, we can see how some of our students, right, are really put at a disadvantages, perhaps, by some of our grading practices. 
And so in our district, policy 1100 um, defines what equity is in Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools. And so you can absolutely pause and read that whole definition, or you can go to the policy itself on the website and look at it. But there are a few key phrases that I, I kind of want to point out. Um, I like this idea of removal of institutional barriers. Grading um, is one of those things for some of our students that has become a barrier because it oftentimes doesn't reflect um, what a student actually knows. And I also want to bring to light and lift up this idea that students should benefit from all aspects of the learning environment. Well, grading is a part of the learning environment. And so if grading is a form of feedback, it's a, a point of data for us, students should still be able to benefit from that. But in a lot of places, we have turned grading into this like this very negative thing where um, we use it as a means to control behavior in a classroom. Um, and so then it can become this very negative thing for all, for some of our students um, and they're no longer benefiting from it. So when we talk about grading and making some shifts and some changes that really um, push us towards more equitable grading practices. This is a journey. It is not a once and done conversation. It is not um, a once and done kind of reflection as a teacher. It's really like leaning into that idea of reflective practices and knowing that this is a journey and there are going to be things, obstacles along the way. Um, there are going to be probably change in routes and all kinds of things as we go on this journey. Um, and I think it's just, it's really important to even be on the journey and to really be thinking through the lens of equity when we, when it comes to grading. So congratulations to all of you that are embarking on this journey. Um, like I said, it is a journey. It is not just, oh, you wake up one day and everything is right as rain and everything is fixed. Um, so, so I want you to think about in a perfect world, what would equitable grading practices look like? And I want you to pause and kind of jot down some notes of what you would think equitable grading would look like in a classroom. And so I've already mentioned his name before, but when I talk about grading, I love the book Grading for Equity by Joe Feldman. I love like the way it's written. Some of you already know, I recommend it quite a bit. But when he talks about equitable grading practices, there are some big pillars um, that he refers to. One of those is for a grade to be equitable, it has to be accurate. And what he means by that is that we can't muddy the water. Um, the calculations that we use for us, like all the categories and weighting and all of that, those need to be sound and easily understood, right? And so there's that part of it, right? That there's not this convoluted, crazy um, waiting system where you can barely figure it out, let alone a parent or a student, but then also accurate in the fact that it needs to correctly describe that student's uh, level of mastery, where they're at um, in their current understanding. And if it doesn't do that, then it is not an accurate reflection. He says that our grades also have to be bias resistant or need to be bias resistant. And I think we would all agree with that. And we have to think biases can run two ways, right? There are positive biases and negative biases. We often, the negative comes to light first, um, but sometimes we'll have a negative or a positive bias towards a student and that can inflate a student's grades. And so we need to try to be in that mind frame um, and be bias resistant. And so, what he says grades shouldn't be based or should be based on valid evidence, right, of a student's content knowledge um, and not letting some of these outside factors influence that. Last but not least, he says for a grade to be equitable, it also needs to motivate students. And what he means by that is the way we grade should motivate students to achieve, achieve academic success. It should support a growth mindset um, and give students multiple opportunities to learn things, right? Um, I love Rick Wormley talks about this, like when we take away a kid's hope, like they can't dig themselves out of the pit, then like, why are, why are we doing what we're doing, right? If we're just, if what we're doing is taking away a kid's hope. And so 
Um, sometimes kids do that with grades, right? They have a plethora of zeros, 20s, 30s, all of those things, and they dig themselves in this hole and they can't dig themselves out. Um, so he talks about the fact that grades should motivate and we need to have a system in place that helps kids dig their way out of that, um, that hole sometimes. So I want to focus, let's take this step by step. And so we're going to look at each pillar and kind of think about what might be some strategies um, that would help us in our quest or our journey to attain that particular pillar. And there are way more strategies than we're going to address today. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And so what would accurate grading look like in your class? And I want you to think about that. How do you ensure that a student's grades accurately reflect where they're at in their progression towards mastery? And also that they can figure that out, like the calculations are OK. How do we do that? So one of the big things that we can do as educators that I feel like is a pretty um, sometimes it's not it sounds like an easy win, um, but sometimes it can um, it sounds easier in implementation than it really is, but it's this elimination of grade fog. And what I mean by grade fog is using some of these non-academic factors in grading, which then really muddies the water, right? It really makes it difficult to tell what a student's level of mastery is. And so some of the things that can help add to this idea of grade fog is the inclusion of effort, right? Effort, that's a behavioral aspect in the classroom and I definitely think we need to um, um, really uplift students who are putting forth a, a lot of effort and really help to motivate students who aren't but should that really influence an academic grade also participation and then also thinking about the types of things that we grade so I will talk from a middle school lens we are we love our interactive notebooks and oftentimes teachers will grade those. Here is an example of um, a checklist from an interactive notebook. This is something like I will not throw anyone under the bus but myself. And so this was a checklist that um, I use prior to, you know, changing certain things. Um, but this was a checklist used for my interactive notebook. So if you look, it has things like notes complete, neatness, um, even like the checklist itself. Some of those things might have been a really good um, check for understanding, but some of it is just notes or readings or annotations and things like that. And so when we think about if their notes are complete, does that really show mastery or is that showing compliance? Also neatness, that's very subjective. I look at this now and cringe a little bit, but there are in looking at this, does this really show what a student knows, right? Does that interactive notebook really show the level of content mastery or am I mudding the waters and causing some of that grade fog with how I grade that? Another big area when we talk about grade fog is extra credit. And I think this is one of the things that come from a really good place in teachers' hearts. Like we want to help students out. We want them to do well and succeed. Um, but extra credit can be problematic. A lot of times teachers will include things like canned food and classroom supplies. You can get bonus points or an extra 100 um, if they'll go to events outside of the classroom whether that's an event hosted by like Collidium here or um, maybe it's through the theater, like one of the, the local theaters, whatever it is, or even going to local like cultural events downtown, going to certain restaurants, but getting bonus um, points for those kind of things. Even completion of like having signatures on things like progress reports, report cards, um, lab safety contracts a big one is the completion of the panorama survey like if you can get your parents to do this i'll give you an extra five points or whatever um even when we give extra assignments like oh you didn't do well here is a worksheet if you do this this is extra credit 
what we what research shows is that academically struggling students and then students also from lower income families are way less likely to take advantage of even certain assignments that are given for extra credit. I remember in high school, my world history teacher, um, if we wanted to build a replica of the pyramids, um, he would give us two bonus 100s in the grade book. Well, that's great. Like, you understand what a pyramid is, but does it really show the content knowledge that you were hoping, right? Or is it showing that you have access to resources and are able to build something? So, but research shows that some of our students that we really want to take advantage of the extra credit aren't the ones that do that. And so if not extra credit, then what? And so a strategy that teachers can put in place is this idea of retakes and redos. So anything that's given for a grade within the classroom can then be redone, or if it's a quiz or an assessment, retaken, right? And there can be parameters around this. It is, doesn't have to be a free-for-all, um, and different teachers implement this in the classroom in different ways. Um, and I've done it in different ways in the classroom myself. I used to have to, students had to present me three pieces of evidence of how they relearned, whether that was in class and we did a spiral review or they did something at home, if that was something that they could do, or they stayed for tutoring, um, or if we had extra time in the classroom and they logged in and did a quizzes to review, whatever it was, they had to have three evidences of retake, of relearning before I would let them retake. Um, not always had to be done outside of the class, could have been done in. But there are different ways that you can set this up in the classroom. It doesn't look the same for every teacher, but it's a strategy that we can utilize to help replace um, that idea of extra credit. So I want to pivot and let's talk a little bit about this idea of biased resistance in the classroom. And remember, we want valid evidences of a student's content knowledge. We want to try to mitigate any implicit bias we have as educators. And we also don't want this to reflect a student's environment. And so I want you to think what might bias in grading look like? Like what would that look like if a teacher is grading and there is bias present. So I want you to pause, kind of jot down that thought. And so I want to share a video with you. If you've been in some of my trainings before, this is, I love this video. It is, it's fantastic. Um, but I want to share it with you real quick. that the results were, were interesting to me. Um, uh, I was actually surprised by the results. And so what this study did, we had two researchers who performed a, a study with a group of teachers and counselors. And what they did is they gave the group of, you know, each counselor and each teacher a poorly written essay. You know, they only got one essay to grade. They didn't get a number of essays to grade. And what they did is they changed the name on the essay to either be a white sounding name or a black or brown sounding thing. And they gave this, it asked them to grade it and then give comments on the poorly written essay. Little did they know that no, a student, no student wrote this essay. It was written by the researchers. And they gave the, the counselors and the teachers the essays to grade. And what they found was is that when that the majority, that uh, on average, when um, they thought the writer was white, they gave the essay a lower grade and a lot more comments. And when they thought the writer was black or brown, they gave the essay a higher grade and less comments. So what that tells us is that this is how low expectations manifest itself in the classroom. Because what, what this process, this uh, the results are showing us is that teachers have lower expectations for black and brown students. Like this substandard work, substandard work is the best you can do. So you deserve to pay for this. But you white students, you can do better. So you get a C and you get more confidence.
So we can see that if this is something that's unconscious in a classroom and goes on over time, and it's widespread, the achievement gap is not by accident, it's by design. And so this was a very surprising study in that it's very, it, it's, it's something that unless you study and know the research, you will never ever look for it. But it could be at play in schools every day and in our classrooms. And that to me is probably, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's scary, right, to think about that. There was a similar study done with second grade work, very similar where the work samples were exactly the same. The only difference were the names used, and they were chosen from a list of names that were um, used to indicate whether a student was um, white or if a student was black. And so you can see here, on the left, Connor and Scott, those were names that were used to indicate a white student, whereas Deshaun and Aaron were used to indicate a black student. Those are the only differences between this piece of work. Overwhelmingly, the piece of work on the left was graded higher than the piece of work on the right. And so again, a, a different result, right? But still shows that there is this bias in grading. And so this particular study, what they did was then they introduced a rubric. And so with the introduction of the rubric, um, some of that was mitigated. And so rubrics are a great way to help us mitigate bias. You'll notice I'm going to say mitigate. I'm not going to say eliminate, but to help mitigate bias and grading. And it's not sometimes it's so unconscious, um, especially when you're grading larger assignments, right? Like a big project or a written paper. You might be really, really tough on the first one, but you've graded so many that by the end, you are just, you are done. And so you don't grade it nearly as hard. So some of those things too, right? That's not necessarily a bias per se, but even the inconsistency in grading student work or, um, I mean, there's all kinds of things that could go into play there. And so a rubric can help with that. But even with rubrics, not all rubrics are, are created equal. I'm not throwing anyone under a bus but myself. But I, in seventh grade, we do a forces and motion unit. We did a big project. This, <laughs> you'll see, um, there are four rubrics on one sheet of paper. And I would not even call this a rubric. Again, I'm not throwing anyone under a bus but myself. I use this in the classroom, um, right? I, earlier I talked about grading is a, a journey. It is not um, It is not a once and done conversation. So obviously I went on my own journey in this grading. But if you look at this, I did things like construction of car, materials, ability to move and roll, um, data sheet. Did you have that Newton Laws questions? Like when we did the interview, group evaluation, like they had to do group evaluation because this was a group um, activity. And so, and then a place for comments. And this is what I called a rubric. And so if you're thinking through the lens of standards and how I assess the standards and thinking through the lens of grade fog, there's a lot of that going around here. Like not the best example of what a rubric should be. And so then after working with um, some of our instructional leaders in the building and things like that, um, if I look here, I changed this. And so then you'll see now, as opposed to that little checklist, I have my standards here. I have descriptors of what students need for a level three, two, and one. Um, and then their standards total. However, some of those things that I still, as a science teacher, I want students to be able to do, like presentation of evidence, collaboration with groups, those are great soft skills that we need, data collection. There, there is still a place for me to report that, but I keep the academic and then my soft skills separate. And my soft skills are things I'm going to communicate to my students, but I'm not going to let it influence the academic grade um, from up above. And so you'll see there is quite a big difference from that first example to this example. And so as we're creating rubrics, not all rubrics are created the same. So thinking about content skill, content or skills versus soft skills and really separating those out and being mindful with that idea of grade fog, um, 
what is what does the standard say they need to know and not that the soft skills that you want students to exhibit aren't important absolutely communicate that but let's not let it affect the academic grade share the rubric with students um, taking time to teach students how to read that rubric and show exemplars. And I know that eats into instructional time, but at the same time, it might save you time on the back end when you're grading students or you're having certain conversations with students. If part of the assessment is oral or anything like that, you can lean into that rubric um, to facilitate some of those conversations. Have students practice using the rubric and then making sure it's written in student friendly language um, so that they they get it they know what's being asked of them one other idea when thinking through um, when thinking about bias resistance um, and how to do that in the classroom sometimes just seeing a student name <laughs> we have certain thoughts about certain students or certain preconceived notions or ideas and so blind grading is another way that we could help to mitigate some of that bias that may exist in grading. And so certain tech tools will definitely allow you to do that. ClassKick has a blind grading option. So does um, SpeedGrader in Canvas will also allow you to hide names um, so that you could so that you're not being influenced by seeing that student's name there. If they're turning in something tangible, you can always randomly assign numbers um, and just have the number on there or have students put their name on the back so, you, so it's not the first thing that you see. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to implement this, but blind grading is another way that you can kind of see, are they really meeting the standard um, or am I letting like what I know about this student influence the way that I grade them? So let's shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about this idea of motivation. Now, some of the strategies we've already talked about, like retakes and redos, I could put here as well, because allowing students multiple opportunities and eliminating some of that anxiety if they don't do well the first time um, can be very motivating for students. Right. And so when we think about motivation as a whole, right? There's been so much research done just around motivation. I love to reference the work of Daniel Pink, and he has some different factors that can help increase intrinsic motivation. One of those being autonomy, which is the urge to direct our own lives. So giving people autonomy can help motivate them. Mastery, the desire to get better at something that matters. And I think that really, I mean, ties into what we're talking about today. But if if someone feels they can master something um, that can help increase that intrinsic motivation and then purpose, the yearning to do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. Daniel Pink says any one of these can help create intrinsic motivation. Um, but if you have all three of them, you have hit the trifecta. And so when we think through the lens of grading, right, if I teach one day, I allow them to practice the next day and then I assess and it might not be quite that linear. I, I get that, but and then I assess them and they don't do well. And then the next day I move on. Students don't feel like they have that chance to master something. Right. Um, and so I want to talk about a couple strategies that might help with that motivation factor. One of those is this idea of reteaching. And I know we're talking about grading, but if we don't reteach or find ways to spiral that content or provide students with resources that they can go in and relearn, the retakes and redos are going to do no good. So reteaching, right? And in this fast paced pacing guide world that we live in, this is a struggle. I know it's a struggle. I'm living the struggle. How do we do that? And so one of the things that I've seen some teachers do is this: they pick a day and they'll call it like throwback Thursday or flashback Fridays. And they will use that day, either the whole class or part of the class to either where students are individually going back and relearning. Teachers might be pulling small groups or as a whole class, the teacher does a small mini review, spiral review of a concept. 
And so, yes, we have this pacing guide we have to follow, but picking a day where we really look at the data and then go back and reteach some of that content that students may not have gotten. Another, I referenced this in, um, I think, last month's, there was an article or a podcast around choice-based seminars, which really, that sounds very fancy. It's a great way to, um, if you're in middle or high school, to kind of um, use mature language around this idea of small group instruction. And so I love this idea. It's something that I'm going to try in the classroom this year with my students. Um, I'm going to pick a day of the week and offer while they're doing warm ups or while they're working on a playlist, offer them the opportunity to then attend a small group session around a certain standard. And again, that if we think about what we just said with Daniel Pink, autonomy, because they have the choice, it's their choice to attend and to sign up, but also that idea of mastery, right? that it provides them with another opportunity to master that content. Um, and of course, it's a choice. I may really nudge certain students, but um, but that podcast was really great. It was by the Cult of Pedagogy, and I really liked that idea for a way to kind of personalize and build in student choice, um, but also to kind of to reteach some of those things. Even I know there are lots of teachers that will do stations, either weekly stations like on Monday, this group of students are doing this station for their warm up or or even if you're doing a station rotation on a daily, um, having a station that is specifically um, geared towards reteaching or going back and reviewing old content. And it's not that you necessarily have to recreate the wheel, pull things you've used before, reuse old playlists, old videos, um, use some of the district resources that we have and pull those things um, to then have students go back and review and relearn. You could even leverage things like your warm ups or even if or homework, right? And giving differentiated warm ups. Not everybody has to do the same warm up, right? Um, or giving differentiated homework to help reteach. And I think that for me goes to that purpose when we talk, not only the mastery, when we talk about Daniel Pink's like drivers for motivation, but also the purpose, right? The purpose for homework, everybody's not doing the same homework now. I'm really doing something that is supposed to help me in my journey and my learning and it can become a little more um, personal for that student. As always, we have a ton of grading resources um, out there. There are lots of individuals who have done lots of research around grading. And so I will share this link. It is embedded in the slide deck, um, but this is a running document. As people send me things, as I come across things, I add and update this resource. Um, and so there's all kinds of things, book recommendations, YouTube videos. There are all types of things embedded within this, um, within this document that are there for you. Again, as you start this journey, so there were several different strategies, elimination of grade fog, elimination of extra credit, and in its place, retakes, redos, blind grading, the use of rubrics, but really thinking about how we design those rubrics and then different strategies for reteaching so that those retakes and redos really fulfill the purpose, right? Um, things like flashback Fridays, throwback Thursdays, um, choice seminars, differentiated homework or warm ups to help reteach and spiral. If you have questions or you want to brainstorm different ways to utilize some of that, you want feedback on a rubric that you've created to help grade. You have suggestions for different strategies um, to put in place in the classroom to help grading be more equitable and to support student learning. Please reach out to us. Um, myself and Melinda, we are here to help. Um, we are here as supports for you all. Um, and then if you need a sounding board or you need, um, we're happy to share any ideas that you have as well with the larger group.